Sorry, sorry for the delay. We're having some technical problems. Um, Eric uh, always uh, loads the three shows into the projector, and then at the same time, he's uh, recording the shows for YouTube. So he's got a lot of balls to juggle all at once. Um, so this must be the masked side. <laughs> so many people over here in masks, and then over there, nobody's in a mask. Okay, um, Claire, would you stand up, please, and say something? I would love to. Thank you, Lynn. Um, in the back, as long as we have a delay, because we must know what's in the back, um, I have some leftovers from a Sister Cities event today. There's some empanadas that you're welcome to get for one, a couple of those, and some wonderful little Norwegian waffles with lingonberry or that great Norwegian cheese on them. So please help yourself. Take them away. Don't leave any behind. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. Sure. Elaine? Um, well, um, Lynn has asked me to, to share some information with you about the upcoming studio tour. It's the annual um, art studio tour. I have some cards here. And Lynn and I are going to um, do this together in Tom Holtz's studio. And it, the date is, uh, we're going to be there for two days. Saturday, October 14th, and Sunday, October 15th. So um, please come visit us. And you will be getting maps to see place, other places and other studios. And for those of you who don't know much about it, it's open to the public. It's free. <laughs> oh, OK. Did, did you not hear me? <laughs> anyway. Um, when I will be showing necklaces. I make necklaces. And um, Lynn will be showing um, sewn plastic spy pigeons. They are little pigeons you'll see on these cards. They are little pigeons that have recording devices in them. So if you see one under your table, don't talk about <laughs> anything. Don't talk about anything you don't want shared to the public because these little pigeons will know. You, you probably noticed those pigeons. You're at a sidewalk cafe, and they're roaming around under your table. Look closely. Yes, <laughs> do look Not closely. Kidding. So um, I'm going to, did you bring some cards as well? Yes. So where are yours? In back? Um, somewhere. So why don't you put those on the table back okay. there? Great. I don't need it while I've got this microphone. <laughs> OK. Um, so uh, next month's tripod is September 15th. So we're going back to the third Friday of the month. Um, uh, this time we had to uh, take the fourth Friday because the church was planning some other event on our regular night. So next month, we're back to the normal thing. And I'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. So I want to introduce um, Davis Freeman. He's our first uh, speaker tonight. Um, he's an instructor, lecturer, and student of the history of photography. Past president of the American Society of Media Photographers and current board member at the U of W Seattle's Photography Certificate Program. Davis has driven around the block a few times. When he was asked to participate in tonight's tripod, he suggested he could provide a short history of the technical changes in photography from the earliest experimentations to the current AI revolution. It was later that evening he exclaimed, WTF. <laughs> Does everybody know what that stands for? Then, with his usual headstrong gusto, he jumped into the project, spending a delightful few weeks rereading and researching the most interesting and important technical changes that he is presenting this evening. Davis? Thank you. <laughs> Hello, all. <laughs> 
Yeah, it was quite a task. <laughs> so, good evening. I first want to uh, thank Lynn and Eric. Let's get, and Lynn has been doing tripods now for over eight years organizing them. So let's give her and him a big round of applause. I don't want to mess this up. So tonight I have two desires. The first is giving you an entertaining overview of the history, of the technical history of photography. And the second, hopefully, will pique your interest to go out and study uh, the history of photography, or at least pick up on the things you like. So let's get started. Uh, before the 1800s, oh, didn't do it. Oh, God. Well, maybe it's the wrong one. Hold on. Oh, no backwards? No. It does it. Oh, oh, that's an idea. Oh, Eric, <laughs> help. <laughs> oh. oh, that's the right program. Uh, that's it. Let's see. Okay, well, that's one. Okay, before 1800, uh, there were a few ways to capture a moment, a family moment. Uh, and those ways could only be afforded by people with a lot of money. Uh, common people, there's no way to, to uh, photograph your family, your children, your weddings, etc. Today, let's see if this works now. Oh, God. Not working. Not working. Should I push the OK? Just for the heck? Yeah, that's what I'm doing. On on the on this side, yes, sir. Lynn, is it on? That's it, right? Yeah. Uh, try the other button. Uh, try the other one. On the other side, the left. Should I, Lynn? No. Why not? No. 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 Oh. Uh oh. I messed it up. Thank you. There we go. More or less. <laughs> well, let's see. But you got to go with it. Let's see if I can. It goes forward and backwards, yes? Yeah. Oh, that worked. OK. Here we go. <laughs> we'll give you an extra minute. Yeah, oh, thank you. <laughs> I met, mine's a minute shorter anyway. Uh, before the 18, let's see, where are we? Today we photograph everything from birthdays to picnics to weddings and the ubiquitous selfie. Everywhere there's a selfie. Everybody wants to do selfies, selfies, selfies. <laughs> so, 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 let's see if I can go backwards. It works so well. I'm just going to. Oh, there we go. So what is a photograph? So the many <laughs> definitions. One is an image captured by light and stored for future use. And what is, a, what is photography? Photography is the art or process of producing images by capturing light on a sensitive surface, such as film or optical sensors. Over the last 200 years, thousands of innovations <clears throat> have occurred. Uh, the creative development have occurred in photography. The first 50 years were devoted to finding a surface to capture the image uh, on that offered quick exposure, able to replicate itself with an image that wouldn't fade, and smaller, more portable cameras. Tonight, I'll explore many of these innovations, and more importantly, how photography has affected our lives and society as a whole. Let's start with that one. Uh, can you hit me forward, please? So let's start with Joseph Niepce in 1814. He's a French, photographer, French experimenter and would be a photographer. In 1814, he produced the first photographic image using what was called the camera obscura. Uh, once forward, please. Uh, there we go. And the camera obscura uh, means dark chamber in Latin. 
Basically, it was a big chamber that you used to take the outside light through a pinhole, basically a very small hole, which would project the outside image on a wall inverted upside down. Now, many, many artists used this, Rembrandt, Vermeer, and others. They just had to paint or illustrate. Photographers had to capture an image, and this image on the back wall is way too slow. However, <laughs> let's see. Next, please. Uh, <clears throat> however, uh, <clears throat> Niebs created his first image. Here it is uh, from his window in Paris. And it's called, he called it the window at Le Gras, probably in French. But in English is in the exposure time. I won't have anybody guess because we don't have time. The exposure time was estimated to be between 8 and 16 hours over two days. Wow. Yeah, and it was a little out of focus, too because it was done with a camera obscura. One more, please. There we go. Another Frenchman, Louis Daguerre, worked with Niepce on many projects over, over in developing his own process over several decades. As the decades progressed, a battle ensued between the two men and who could present their findings to the French Academy of Sciences first. Uh, <clears throat> through some backstabbing and political intrigue, Daguerre was given the approval as the first photograph for, and for a century or more was considered the father of photography. Daguerre called his invention the daguerreotype. Here's an image. Oh, it, it did it, unless he did it. Anyway, <laughs> here's, here's his image also from his Paris hotel, uh, Paris uh, apartment. And this was about a 15-minute exposure, down from about eight hours. Now, you, you wonder where everything is on the street. Well, because 15 minutes, horses, people walking, running, except in the lower left-hand corner, you'll see a gentleman with a leg up. He's getting a shoe shine. He must have stood there long enough to get an image on this piece of uh, daguerreotype. OK. So. Our own modern, oh no, I'll go ahead, let's see, let's try this. Ah, yes, we're working now. And uh, later that year in America, the daguerreotype had made it over the ocean. And this gentleman, Robert Cornelius, took the daguerreotype, took a picture of himself, wrote on the back the first portrait with the daguerreotype. Of course, today in our modern culture, we would call that the first selfie. <laughs> Or as our modern culture might, uh, uh, of course, we continue to be consumed with the humble approach with today's selfies. <laughs> By the 1850s, the daguerreotype and the idea of a photograph quickly spread throughout the Western world. Working class families for the first time could afford to have pictures taken of individuals, oh, it's working, uh, families, and in their day, uh, deceased family members. They call these things post-mortems. This is a young girl who, who died, and either the photographer came to them or they brought the body to the photographer. Photography spread in all forms of human interaction as well as landscapes and more through the decades, and technical advances continued. This fellow here is Matthew Brady. In 1841, he had a daguerreotype studio in New York City. The time of the Civil War, he offered his services to the, I guess, the Union to go out and photograph the war. He was using a different process by then, though. It was called the wet collodion. Now, the wet collodion required a dark room on location. The, let, the, the wet collodion created a glass negative. So this is one of the first glass, positive, glass negatives that you could reproduce prints from. There was a paper one years earlier, but it gave you a fuzzy print. So, however, to get here, you had to have a dark room, which you see here. You see his camera on the right. That was their dark room. And on the far left is uh, where he carried his equipment. They went into the field. He and several of his associates take simple pictures like this, Robert E. Lee with some of his staff, and scenes after the battle. Now, you need to know these guys went out and drug these dead bodies over to make a nice composition. And this is what they ended up with, among hundreds more. I have to say, as friends with photojournalists, they do not do this today. They take what's real and there. In 1882, 
George Eastman, a guy, Nate wanted a company, and he called it Kodak. Now, I don't know if you've ever wondered what Kodak means, but I did years ago. Turns out Eastman liked the, the K sound, and he provided four more letters that, that just went with the K that could be pronounced in any known language at the time, Western language, basically. So Kodak means absolutely nothing but can be pronounced in French, Italian, Greek, etc. In 1888, they came out with this first ad. You press the button, we do the rest. So they gave you a camera with a roll of film that could take 100 images. You took the pictures, you sent the camera in to Kodak, it took the film out, developed 100 images, put more film back in, sent you back a camera with film and the 100 prints, all for the sum of $25, which by today's standards would be about $600 or, or more. Then in 1900, uh, yeah, 19, 1905 was the first 35 millimeter came out. However, this camera really didn't become popular among photographers till the 30s or 40s, and really didn't take over till about the mid-60s. Before the mid-60s, photojournalists in particular tended to use 4x5 cameras. We'll get back to this in a little bit. Um, so, uh, where are we? Okay, so let's jump back to right the turn of the 19th, uh, 20th century. A guy named Louis Hine had a real interest in photographing children working. Back then, 100 plus years ago, you could, there was no age limit for work. So this girl, I'm thinking between 12 and 14 years old, was working in a factory. Think today, Amazon factories, you get it every day. What if they had 12 year olds working there? He also went out to the coal mines and the fields. These boys, there are a few older ones in the back, but they're mainly again between 12 and 14, 15 years old. These pictures were used, his pictures were used to change, <coughs> to help change and enact labor laws for children in the uh, early 1920s. By the 30s, film was quicker to expose. Uh, the time to capture an image went from hours to parts of a second. Cameras were continuing to get smaller and photographic images had begun to saturate the culture. The world was changing through the photograph. In uh, 1899, uh, flash powder was introduced. In 1927, the flash bulb. And then in 1931, this fellow in the middle, Harold Egerton, worked at MIT. He created the, elect the electric flash. The first time you could see a bullet fired and, and stopped in midair and being in focus. I had the opportunity to meet and listen to him when I was a young photographer. And, Incredible stories. He, he made my skin just crawl. It was so fantastic. Then uh, in 35, Kodachrome came out by Kodak. To me, Kodachrome film, color film, was the best color film for 35 millimeter that ever existed. A few years later, Edward Land came out in 1937 with his Polaroid Land camera. And, oh, I have to toot my horn here. So in 1988, 1988, I was working with 4x5 Polaroids, they look like this, and a 4x5 camera. My film ran out, so I picked a, an unusual film off the shelf. And when I developed it, you pull it apart, and you throw away this, that's the negative, and you keep the positive. Well, when the thing went to the floor, I went, that's kind of interesting. And so I picked it up and looked at the negative. So what you see here is the positive on the left, the negative in the middle, and then I thought, what would happen if I turned that negative back into a positive? And that's the one you see on the right. And I really thought that was cool. So I started using and developing that as a commercial and artistic style. Um, what I, there we go. This was my first image I was doing that day. This is a DNA sequencing, it's like an x-ray, you, you fold around. And I thought was just so much more interesting looking, I thought. Than, uh, <clears throat> than what I was doing. So I sent this into Kodak, I'm sorry, into Polaroid, and I wrote a letter, you know, 1989, no email. I said, I can do this with your film. And they said, no, you can't. And so I sent them this picture, and they wrote back and said, yes, you can. <laughs> and then about four or five years later, they said, would you mind if we used your picture on the, 
one of your photographs on the color of our creative techniques that goes internationally and give you a two or three page spread inside on how you do your technique. And I said, yes, I was flattered, obviously. So we'll get back to the history. 1968, uh, Earth Rise. This, this was, uh, I don't know what that means. But, oh, I'm fine. Thank you. Uh, Earth Rise. Uh, it was taken from the moon on Christmas Eve. This is a beautiful picture, and it's considered one of the most influential environmental photographs ever taken. We have to hurry along a bit. So 18, 1984, Canon, first electric, electronic still camera. They use floppy disks. Remember those guys? Floppy disk in the back of the camera to capture the image. Fast forward to 1990. And then for 10 years, there was a huge debate in commercial photographers and artists, too, from film to digital. If digital uh, uh, photograph is digitally going to get rid of film, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know what happened. But film has had a resurgence over the last five or 10 years, which is great. 1990, this changed photography forever, Photoshop. My images, my illustrious types, I call them, I used to sell them, sell the idea commercially, and I was being told, we can do this in the studio, why do we have to hire you? And I said, you can do the technique, but I have the vision. That lasted a while, and then I switched over more to uh, personal work. 2007, we know this one, right? iPhones and more selfies. Don't we ever stop wanting selfies in this country? So <clears throat> now a few words on AI. Uh, AI has become a grave concern for the commercial photographers. Many say, why hire a photographer to go out a week on location when the graphic designer or AI person can do this at the studio after a half an hour or two of their time? This is just beginning, and this debate is just starting. Now, last two images. The first image was taken in the 1850s of Lu Louisa May Alcott, a daguerreotype. The second image was, uh, and the reason I showed them both, because I felt they were slightly similar in look and style, the second image just won an international contest. A German photographer submitted this to Sony, and he won the World Photography Award, and he refused to accept it. You know why? Because he said, this isn't a photograph. This is an AI. There's nothing photographic about it. So the next few years are going to be interesting. Am I OK with time? Yeah. OK, let's do our selfie now. Oh, <laughs> to hell with it. <laughs> I'll see you guys at the movies. <laughs> Thank you. Question? Any questions? I, I want to say something that's not a question. First of all, you put so much work into this show. Um, that was a fabulous, uh, fast stroll through photographic history. Plus, you put up with the technology problems. <laughs> I admire that a lot. Thank you, Lynn. I can tell you, a week ago, a week ago, I went through my first test of the, it was 45 minutes long. That was a week ago. <laughs> and we didn't go camping that weekend, and I worked on this all weekend. Got it down to 14 without the technical difficulties. Yes, sir. You had a question? Well, you mentioned AI and so What do you uh, expect to happen in the future? What do you? That is. That what, is. What's going to happen to photos? What's going to happen to photography? I, 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 there's photography, commercial, and photography as we know it. You know, like point and shoots. And I think the point and shoots will probably stay more or less the same. And uh, but when you send it in, they'll take care of all your wrinkles and stuff. The commercial side, I don't know. You know, there may not be photographers, commercial photographers, much longer. In, in a larger sense. They'll still need headshots and things like that. But it's a big debate right now. I closed my studio about eight years ago, and I'm so glad I did, right when this is all starting. That's a very good question. I wish I had a better answer. So maybe you could go back to the one image that won the award that is AI. Yes. Could you tell us what made it so convincing or unreal, maybe? Uh, uh, I, I can, can you run me back one, Eric? Uh, I can tell you, yes, I think, answer both of those. Um, 
one of the discussions the German photographer brought up is why didn't all you smart people understand this was AI? Look at, the, look at her, uh, to your left, the hand and the fingers. That's not a normal hand. And if I were to see that, uh, Andrew, who will be talking later about AI more, he would snap onto this immediately. It's really hard to get hands done. Why did, I've judged a lot of contests, not a lot, but a fair amount, and you have like five seconds to make an assumption about a picture because you're looking at 6,000 pictures in a day. It's possible they overlooked it, and he made it with the little flaws in it to make it seem like it was an old process. And tin types are really popular now. You see them around, and some other older type techniques. So I'm guessing they just overlooked it because of their haste mm -hmm. and their, their focus on the feel and mood of this photograph. And there's two, uh, I don't know, something fluttering through the picture too. Yeah, I think he put that in to make it seem old. Okay. You know, like he had to Just do curious. it. In, yeah, someone had a question here. Well, when, when you uh, call this AI, does that mean they've um, stolen the images of these two people? No. They're completely made up out of... He, he said, I want two women that feel like the 1850s, like a daguerreotype, and I want one to be looking away from the camera and one in. Boom. And this is after iterations. And again, Andrew will give you a better idea of this because he's going to work through one of his. Okay. But there's, Wait and see. This was a blank <laughs> page. He typed in two women, ba ba ba, and this is what, who knows, he may have had 50 images to choose from. But he, there were, these are not real people in any way. Right. Yeah. Don't yeah, they don't exist. But it sparked a fantastic debate because yes. it had been done, it had been possible, it had been the award. Yes. So and he wanted to yeah. spark the debate. That's why he did it yeah. big time. Yeah. Any other questions? Good questions. Well, thank you all. It was a pleasure, and even with the difficulties. Thank you all. <laughs> Oh, one last quick thing. I have a couple of the uh, uh, types. A couple of illustrious types up here after the program. If you want to come up and take a peek, here's some of here's some of my work, and this is the original one that I showed you. So feel free to come up and take it. And these are uh, test prints, so you can touch them and all. They're not that expensive. Other than time. Thank you. Is that mine or yours? Oh, Oops. Oh, that's mine. Mine. Eric, can we get a new one of these? <laughs> it's we not the clicker that's the problem. It's that I'm juggling multiple things on the computer, and so the computer is trying to figure out which keyboard is which. Did everybody get that? <laughs> well, it, I think it must be frustrating for everybody. And uh, I want to congratulate the audience. You guys are so good and so patient and so sweet. And you come to these uh, tripods all the time, and you never know what you're going to get. And it's usually great like it is tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so. So next is Rosalie Lynch, who is an art photographer based here in Tacoma. Uh, from her native Ireland, Rosalie's passion for travel and world culture has taken her around the globe to live and photograph on five continents. With a successful career over the past 20 years and with work ranging from commercial to documentary, Rosari now focuses exclusively on fine art photography focuses, get it? <laughs> her work has been widely published and her art is uh, in many private collections. She has exhibited at the Annenberg Space for Photography in LA, Photographic Center, Northwest Seattle Center, uh, McCall Hall and Benaroya Hall in Seattle, Vashon Island Center for the Arts, 
and the Community Gallery at Tacoma Art Museum. Work from her fine art project, Paper Glass Paper, was exhibited in the Ireland Glass Biennale at Dublin Castle, and her two exhibited pieces were acquired for the Irish State Art Collection. Work from the same series is currently in the Irish Contemporaries ex Exhibition in LA, and Rosalie is currently working on two new projects inspired by her artist residency at Allerton Park, the University of Illinois, this past spring. Rosary. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so, it's like life's like a box of chocolates and you never know what you're gonna get, you get me next. <laughs> so, I'm gonna see if, uh, Thank you. Is that better? Okay, great. So when I was thinking about a title for the presentation, Chasing Light seemed very apt because as photographers, it's literally what we do. And it's all also a little metaphorical. So I thought I'd give you some background and share some images from the different phases of my career and tell you about some of the key decisions in my life and also the pure luck in some cases that have helped to shape it. So I guess uh, the first bit of luck was that I was born in Ireland and I've now lived in the Pacific Northwest for 22 years. The second bit of luck is that I've lived in Tacoma for four years mm -hmm. and absolutely love it here. Um, so I grew up in County Cavan and you may not even have heard of Cavan. It's one of the overlooked counties in Ireland. Um, it's it's uh, in a country with so many visual jewels it can often get overlooked, but this is a Neolithic burial site. Um, it was, it's called the calf shed because a farmer about 200 years ago actually used it as a calf shed. Um, so geographically, it's about 50, Cavan is about 50 miles northwest of Dublin. And it tends to be overlooked, but it's extraordinary and it's very ethereal. It's a slow county, you have to absorb it. Um, and I guess for me it's been more influential than I ever realized in shaping the way I see and how I photograph. Um, the work I do at the moment is about observing uh, the overlooked and finding beauty where it's not readily apparent. And more reasons that Calvin is extraordinary. Um, the famous River Shannon actually rises in County Cavan in the Quilca Mountains. And we have 365 natural lakes in Cavan. So just for um, perspective, um, Cavan's about half the size of Pierce County. And so for me, um, growing up, I'll go back to this one, you know, photography was almost always an impulse for me. I would race home from school and I would grab my mom's little plastic 110 camera to capture pictures of the light and paste them all up over my ceiling and then, you know, look at that world and imagine where it might take me in the future. Um, at the time, I never realized that photography could be a career option. Our school was very focused on academics, and so I dutifully went off to London and uh, did a degree, um, had a... Um, BSc and worked as a radiation therapist. And so I worked in London and Oxford and then also Australia as a radiographer. But that job is one of the um, parts of my life that I'm so grateful for. It was completely instrumental in giving me perspective and on shaping how I live and how I do what I do. Because we would, we would get to know patients over about six weeks, sometimes on their courses of treatment and over and over, we heard uh, the stories of the things people had always wanted to do or the regrets they had, the jobs they got stuck in. And I had heard the story one time too many, and I just decided that I didn't know what I did want to do, but I wasn't going to just wait for it to happen to me. So I guess when in doubt, my uh, mode has always been to travel. And so I took off and did a backpacking trip around the world. Um, and uh, 
yeah, on that trip, um, I actually uh, had another bit of luck. I was backpacking in Australia and met my husband, Len. He was also backpacking and in a similar phase of life as me. He had quit his job and gone traveling to figure a few things out. So um, we had the one day that we met to decide if we would ever see each other again. We were both bound for different countries the next day. Um, but we made a smart decision, and, and here we are. So um, that backpacking trip, though, was where I realized my complete passion for photography. And I, was, I had a little point-and-shoot camera, and I was so in love with all of the cultures and the scenes, and I couldn't capture most of them with my point-and-shoot. So when I got to Australia, I got a short-term job as a radiographer so that I could afford to buy an SLR, and then I started teaching myself black and white photography. And so uh, this is a, an image of the Atlantic Ocean in Ireland, uh, photographed it off the coast of Donegal, um, hanging out over a cliff edge, and Len was actually holding my ankles not to let me drop over the edge. <laughs> so that's the Atlantic Ocean that I crossed to come here to the Pacific. So... Um, I went to the Art Institute in Seattle, and then uh, I did an internship at Red Rocks in Colorado, and uh, mostly for the fun of like photographing rock stars, because who wouldn't? And so these are just two of my favorite shows from that time, Tom Petty, and then also the Kodo Drummers. Um, I don't know if you've been to see a show in, in Red Rocks, but the acoustics are just fantastic, and especially the Kodo Drummers, it was so beautiful. And so then that led to me working for Seattle Opera, and I worked for them for about 10 years or so. And did a lot of uh, stage and theatrical work, as well as um, more commercial kind of uh, medical centers and a variety of different, um, different work. I've been fortunate to photograph a lot of my heroes, so Jane Goodall, um, the lady on top is uh, Ireland's first female president, Mary Robinson. She's also an environmentalist. She's a fantastic woman. Um, Mohammed Yunus is the gentleman on the bottom left. He won the Nobel Prize for um, developing the microfinance in the developing world. Um, and top right is Leo Varadkar. He was um, our Taoiseach, which is equivalent to a prime minister. And he was our first, not only immigrant, but he was our first gay immigrant leader. And so big strides for Ireland. <laughs> oh, and I should tell you, actually, um, on Christmas, uh, 20 more plus years ago, uh, I was home in Ireland helping in the kitchen. They shouldn't have let me. I slashed my thumb with uh, the kitchen knife, and it was a pretty good bad gash, Len brought me up to emergency, and the doctor did a beautiful job of sewing it up. It turns out that that doctor was Leo Varadkar, who became our prime minister. <laughs> and then, years later, I was hired to photograph the event. He, he made his inaugural trip um, to the US. He made it to Seattle, and that was a huge deal for Seattle. And so, while we were in doing, um, you know, the initial meet and greet and, you know, checking through our list of photos and everything else, we got in a discussion. I had said to him, you know, I think this was yours. And he said, let me look at that. And he said, yeah, that looks like my work. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a beautiful scar if anybody wants to see. <laughs> so, um, so going back to, um, like, just the career path, um, I worked in commercial photo studios in Seattle for a couple of years. And I Never really wanted to do product photography, but I did it for a while to, to teach myself the skills and to learn. And I, I had some fantastic photographers that I worked with and learned from. And so it became particularly um, crucial when I was photographing for artists, particularly glass. And so I specialized in, in glass for the last number of years. And that was uh, one of Deborah Moore's when they opened the Benaroya Wing at the Tacoma Art Museum. So uh, travel has always been uh, a key motivator for me. And this was 
a little hut in Zambia that I actually lived in for a little while. And so um, another kind of uh, story that had come about by just taking a chance. Um, I took a bus, I got to Lusaka, I had planned to stay there longer. Len was supposed to meet me, but his trip got changed around. So I just went to the bus station and got on a bus and that was going the furthest west that I could possibly go. And so I ended up in this hut living with a chief and his family and getting to know the villagers. Um, and I also did some documentary work for the World Food Program while I was in Zambia. It's one of the chiefs in the village. Um, I did the same thing then in Tanzania um, a year later and had some incredible experiences. Um, some of the tribal scarification. A little boy called Freddy and his goats. The grandmother of a little child we were visiting. And then this one. This one is... <laughs> If, if, if of all the people, you can have friends like these in the world. These little boys were leading me to uh, see their father's farm, and they were so proud and excited. And the little boy on the left, they had fallen, and he fell, and his pants fell down. And without missing a beat, the other little boys picked him up and linked arms like that and strode on. It was just kind of precious. Um, this image comes from a project that I uh, subsequently worked on in Tanzania. Um, it's uh, on raising awareness on people with albinism. And so it's a, it's a sensitive and deep uh, topic, and I won't get into too much of it, but I just wanted to show a couple of the beautiful people from that project. And again, um, the influences in life. Um, my first career as a radiation therapist um, was very helpful because I could help um, identify skin cancers and educate people on what to look for and then assisted some people actually from rural areas to get to Dar es Salaam for treatment. And then my soul food. I've always done side projects and my own work. Um, I combine in a love of poetry and the dance. These are photographed on film, um, on medium format camera, and doing multiple exposures in camera. So I are on the other side of life from AI and um, Photoshop. I try and do everything I can in camera. Um, this one was five exposures, which was in a lot of planning for the technical side, and also the dancer was fantastic because she could pick her mark every time and hit it. Uh, this one comes from Connections, and it's an abstract idea of the Irish dancer. And so the traditional costume and swirl, I actually photographed it using the reflection of stained glass in a brass bell. And again, modifying light on glass, so, um, not letting the, gla the light go through glass so that it um, you know, had the essence of stone. So this is after Newgrange in Ireland. It's another Neolithic burial site. And getting a little more abstract, um, I deeply feel like we need to protect our environment and in every way possible and to highlight both the, uh, the un unseen beauties and the uh, travesties at the same time. So um, there's actually a Henry Miller quote, and it says, the moment one gives close attention to anything, even a blade of grass, it becomes a mysterious, awesome, indescribably magnificent world in itself. And that, I guess, is the world that I live in when I photograph and how I see and feel. This was the discarded burnt paper, a fan scene. And maybe, can I go on? Oh, yeah, there. Oh. Um, and then down on my belly with a macro lens, um, just finding the texture and the details. And this one comes from... Uh, paper glass paper, so from observing glass artists and how they work, um, the burnt paper that they use to protect their hands as they blow the glass, um, it's a wet, uh, wet wads of paper, and so the heat from the glass sears through it and burns it, and it's a soggy mess that they normally throw away, but I've been collecting those papers and dried them out, and when they're dried, they become this beautiful sculptural 
piece in itself, and then all the layers separate, and I do um, abstract macro um, images. Oh, not red ones like that. Not like that either. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Should I just, there you go. Well, there's an abstract landscape. Oh, I don't know what's happening there, Eric, but I'll just keep going. Um, The gremlins got in here, Eric, I think. Um. <laughs> AI, oh no. <laughs> well, if anybody would like to look at more of those images, they are on my website at rosari.com in the portfolios, and that one's glass paper glass. Oh, okay, no, but that's okay, that's okay, okay, that's okay. Um, if we have time, I have a two-minute video, and if we don't, we can just, we can just end. Do we have time or no? It's okay either way. Okay, so I have a video that um, I... I photographed, I'd been invited to um, participate in Galway 2020. Galway was the city of culture for 2020. And so I had done a project on um, my feelings as an immigrant artist. And I'd gone back to Ireland and I photographed landscapes, not per se to um, capture the landscape, but just because it, it revives memories and infuses the ideas in us. And so the video that I had um, ended up taking is the, my experience, but the voice of the sea. Yeah. And we stayed a few days. How did you communicate? Do they speak English? Do you speak whatever language? Yeah, they they speak um, quite a lot of English. Um, actually, the chief didn't though. Um, so wherever I went, you have to check in with the local police station. 
And first of all, they wanted me to stay with um, a Japanese construction crew who were there working on a project because they had the beautiful block house and everything. And so I had said, oh, no, I'd, I'd much rather um, try and stay with someone local. And so um, we communicated. I, I always try to pick up a few words of language wherever I travel and um, have a, picked up a little bit of Swahili. And so you can get a buy with some of the some of the language. And, you know, body language is universal as well. Um, one of the most beautiful things, I'll just tell you, the, the chief um, had brought me uh, some newspapers. And he had a mango tree in his backyard. And sitting out there, I was looking at the papers, and they were years old. And so I was looking through, trying to figure out why he had given it. And I said, is there an article about the village? And he said, oh, no, reading material. <laughs> and so this years old. So I had carried a Yeats poetry book with me. Um, and when I was leaving, I gave him the book. And I had read The Lake Isle of Free to him. And he sat under the mango tree mouthing the words as he was reading it. It's absolutely, yeah, so beautiful. Yeah. Not so much a question, but yeah. I appreciated your stories about the photographs and everything. That video, though, wow. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Wow. Thanks. Is yeah. it my turn? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK, great. Um, well, I was just curious, because I do a lot of photography, too. Uh, I'm always curious what maybe the, the progress was from the cameras you started with to the ones that you favor now. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Interesting. I, I honestly, well, I started off with that, like, 110 plastic from my mom, and then um, SLRs, I, some, a Nikon SLR in Australia with film. Um, and I have, I shoot with a range of cameras, but when people get too technical about the gear and ask me what I shoot with, I say I shoot with my heart. Mm -hmm. And so, actually, one of my favorite cameras is a pinhole camera made for $7 when I was a student, and I, I still love it. It takes film holders and, uh, and that. But I, I love my medium format camera. It's, uh, it's a Comtax with Zeiss lenses. And so I can either shoot film or I have a digital back to convert with it. So, and a four by five that I can shoot the same way, either digital or film. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I was find your presentation very inspiring, particularly um, that it's never too late to take a chance and move forward and do something that is maybe beyond your comfort zone, but you do it anyway. And I think that's very inspiring. And it's a reminder that it's never too late to jump on something and do it. Thanks. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I was lucky because I had that perspective as a radiographer when I was very young. And so it, it made sense for me to, to go and do it. But absolutely working in careers. My husband followed his passion recently and, you know, is a full-time pilot now because that's what he always wanted to do. And when he was teaching students to fly, how old was Maury Len? 92. Len had a 92-year-old student, <laughs> flying student, who was watching planes take off and land from his residential home in Renton. And he looked at it and thought, that's what I always wanted to do. So he walked into the flight school, and luckily he met Len, who was ready to take a chance on him and take him flying. And yeah, it was fantastic. And he could never fly by himself. He always had to have an instructor with him, but he would take other residents from the home out flying. It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, never too old. Age is all up here for us, I feel. So what age were you when you started? Photography, yeah. or uh, well, so I I moved over here when I was twenty six or seven, twenty seven, twenty seven. So um, Australia, I had left. I had quit my job when I was twenty four, going on twenty five, and travelled for a couple of years, and then worked in Australia, did part time jobs, and um, then came back and did 
went to the art institute and so then picked up a career then after that, so, yeah. What brought you to Tacoma? That's another really good question. Um, community and the sense of community. So I used to have a studio in a building called the 619 in Seattle and we have a friend, Sean Foote, who had a studio in that same building and he had moved to Tacoma, gosh, it must be 12 years ago now, is it, Len? And so he was starting, um, trying to get some art walks and have some shows and uh, we would come down to support him. And as we came down, we got to know Tacoma and the people here and we were, you know, missing the sense of community that we once felt in Seattle and we really wanted to be part of that again. And we, are, we have loved our decision. And standing here tonight in front of you is probably proof of it, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you all for the welcome. Would you stand up and say your name loud and clear? I've been slaughtering it. It's okay. It's Rosari. Rosari. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank it's you. a tricky one. Thank you. So uh, September 15th, the next tripod uh, features the uh, Puyallup tribe of Indians in general with three uh, different presenters focusing on Indians. Uh, Dan Fear will present the fishing wars, and uh, Tim Martin will present uh, images of uh, powwows uh, using uh, Jack Storm's pictures. I don't know him, but he's a friend of Tim's. And uh, we don't know exactly who the third speaker will be. It'll probably be a carver. So I hope you can come September 15th. So our next and last speaker is Andrew Crandall, and he's a Tacoma-based photographer and a digital artist. After serving eight years in the U.S. Air Force, he decided to pursue his passions and explore his creativity. He has enjoyed taking photos since childhood and quickly rekindled that love for the art after rejoining the civilian world. Through his bachelor's in graphic designs, he discovered the process of compositing images using Photoshop. With the recent evolution in generative AI, his capabilities are now limitless. This lit another passionate flame within him and opened the door to so many creative avenues through his photography. Since this discovery, Andrew now sees the world in a new light as suddenly he can manipulate and create a world of his own. He hopes all who see his work can expand their minds to new possibilities. Andrew. Thank you. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew. I'm a photographer and digital artist. Um, I'm gonna be taking you on a bit of a journey today uh, through my process on how I create a hybrid photo using my photography and image generative AI. But before we jump into that, uh, I feel like a little context as to how I got here is important. Uh-oh. Hey, oh, okay, that's skipped ahead a lot. Okay, um, <laughs> so I've always struggled with the blessing and the curse of having both a left and right brain, and that's not to say everyone else here in the room only has half a brain. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's just there's this myth that you know the the left side of the brain is, are in, in some people one side is uh, more active than the other, and then the left is your analytical and the right is your creative. All right, so I grew up as a musician. Um, I'm a percussionist. 
And I spent uh, my free time in school, like, drawing my favorite mangas and animes. I'm a little bit of a nerd. Uh, I love getting lost in the process of creating and performing art. And believe it or not, on the left, those were actually school notes that I was most definitely taking. Uh, <laughs> um, but then here you see me watching the stream of a NASA Curiosity rover landing on Mars. Um, and I do remember crying when it landed. Uh, it was a very emotional moment for me. Uh, and then on the left is a computer that I was building uh, a couple years back uh, for streaming. And uh, I've always had like a, a passion for tech, science, and physics. But then life happened, and after attempting a year of a computer science degree, uh, I joined the Air Force and kind of compartmentalized my creative side. Um, and I was active for six years, and then I decided to uh, uh, transfer to the reserves. And over that time, I had saved up two months of kind of paid vacation um, between that transfer, and I found myself very bored very quickly. Um, so I went out and I bought a Lumix G7 to try and explore the, the photography side that I uh, never was able to explore. Um, it was only an entry-level camera, but it uh, consumed those two months of my life uh, just experimenting and learning the basic principles of photography. Uh, so a year later, I had convinced my wife to let me buy a, a quite a large upgrade, and I'm still using it today, so I'm, I'm still I'm making good use of it. <laughs> um, so uh, over those six, the following six years, I took photos of, of everything that I could, as people, and places, and even the stars. And after starting my degree in graphic design, I started to learn how many possibilities for art there was in my photography. And uh, I was introduced to composites, uh, which to me was the perfect harmony of technology and art. Uh, a composite photo is just a, a multiple photos mixed together using various techniques. And um, you, here you can see the photo of the deer on the left, and then a picture of my wife with her reflection looking back at her. That is a composite within itself, but I couldn't find the other photos. I uh, did that a while ago. But mixed together with, through a lot of work, you get that on the right. And then this brings us to the topic at hand, which is where does AI come into all of this? Um, and what is AI art? Well, a basic overview of what you see behind me um, is this image is entirely AI. And essentially, uh, oh, I lost my place. So you use text prompts, and you put in a string of, of words, a sentence, if you will, and uh, then out pops is what you see here. It takes from like a, a collective of millions upon millions of photos, and then it deconstructs those, and then reconstructs an entirely new image. And then I'm gonna take you through kind of like what it looks like to generate an image, so you get a little gist of the process. On the left you see the, the prompt, um, with there's the commas separating the string of words, and it pulls from each section of those words. And then you can do a lot to fine tune it with how you, you create that string of words as well as there's different inputs you can do, but I'm gonna omit all that because it's not important. Um, so once you've entered the prompt, you're given four outputs, uh, which you can choose either to create an upscaled version or variations of one of those. I chose to upscale the third image, and that was this is the final output. So now you kind of get the basics of how AI images can be generated. Uh, let's move on to my photography. And there's a lot of elements that go into creating a photograph, uh, but I won't go into that today. I'll just let you trust that I know, or that I think I know, how to take a good photo. <laughs> All right, so here's a photo I took of my friend about five years ago. I, I've learned a lot since then. Um, one of those things being composition, which is what I feel is missing from this photo. Um, however, I see that as an excellent opportunity to use it for my new process. So the first step, once I've chosen the photo, I isolate my subject. Um, I won't be going into the nitty gritty here. 
and you can thank Davis and Beth, Beth here in the front for sparing you all of the grueling details of Photoshop. Uh, I, I did have a lot of screenshots and technical things, and they're like, they're probably not going to like this. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I digress. Uh, when working on these composites, uh, I ensure to take into account the environmental factors. If you know how there's kind of like, you can see the tree a little bit behind her, under her shawl. So I removed that texture and kept kind of the, the purple opaqueness. Um, so now that we have our subject, uh, I don't necessarily always know. I have a clear vision of what I want to go with this. And so AI is an excellent tool for finding your inspiration of what you want to do with the project. Um, and I've always loved Japanese culture. And so I wanted to see what my subject would look like lounging kind of next to a Tori gate. Um, and you'll see my prompt on the left and the output on the right. And those last prompts didn't really give me the feel I was going for for that photo. So uh, I tried something new, and I got these outputs. Now, I'm really into surrealism, which you'll see in later photos. Um, and these are just ticking all the boxes for surrealism. And also note that there's not a Tory gate seen anywhere in this, so I guess it just wasn't meant to be. Um, so I tried again. And I, I omitted the Tory gate to kind of let the AI steer in the direction that it decided it wanted to go on its own. Um, and it really, this is the feeling that I, I was going for. And then the winning prompt was chosen, and I upscale it to fit the resolution of the original image. And if you look closely, it's, um, there's slight variations between the lower resolution and high resolution. Um, kind of in the middle of the ring, there's a lot more texture than in the lower resolution, and a lot of the little spiky stuff on the bottom is missing in the high resolution. That's just the nature of how it deconstructs the image and then reconstructs it. So you're not always going to get exactly what you see. Um, it can be a deal breaker sometimes, but it's just part of the process. And then from here, I add it to my artboard, and I try to find a good composition to get uh, a more solidified feel for the direction. Um, I'm feeling this one's a little angelic. Uh, too much contrast for me, it's a little dark. And uh, the aspect ratio is feeling off. I don't really like the, the square look. And it looks like she's sunbathing, but there's not really a sun. Uh, from here, uh, I like to pick a good aspect ratio and uh, I'll expand the artboard. I, I personally have been kind of drawn to more uh, vertical aspect ratios due to the rise of, uh, not selfies, but, <laughs> but just uh, phone-driven media. And now we'll get into the fun stuff, which um, is fighting, but I mean collaborating with the AI. And I really, I really wanted angel wings uh, from the back. And I was really struggling to get an output that, one, didn't have a person in it, because I already have a subject, and two, weren't on the back side of the wings. Uh, since my subject is facing forward. And you can see some of the fun stuff that the AI kind of outputs here, like the man with angel wings coming out of his chest. I don't know how that works. Um, so let's try outsmarting the AI and just come up with some prompts and outside of the box prompts that might be able to get me what I'm looking for. But in this case, I was unable to do so. So I fought for, I fought for a while and came to a compromise which was these angel wings that were ambiguously sighted. Uh, and it's a little too dark for me, so uh, I need to fill in the background. But a little fact about me is I have ADHD, and I like to bounce around a lot. And so I didn't do that yet. <laughs> so if you recall, in a previous slide, I mentioned that it uh, looks like she's sunbathing, but there's no sun. And also, it's too dark, so let's remedy both of those. Uh, so I generated these images, and I thought this one looked promising, but sadly, it was not. And to illustrate or demonstrate why is generally when uh, you want to blend things, um, at least for the way I was doing it, you want the lights, what you want in the photo, bright, and what you don't want, dark. And so this just kind of had like a whitewash effect. So I went back to the drawing board, generated a couple more things, and w we got it. So as you can see, the, the sunbeams are a lot more brighter than the clouds behind them. So uh, now I'm actually filling in the artboard. Uh, so it's all filled in. And I added in 
the sun rays and then blended it all together, erased some elements that I didn't like, and uh, this brings me to what I like to call my uh, my three pillars of of uh, three pillars of realism. So these pillars uh, are what I feel is kind of a requirement for selling that something is a whole and not just a bunch of pieces put together. Uh, the first pillar is the color of the lighting. And so the color of the light source will affect the color of the objects that it's illuminating. And uh, if you take this lovely and not creepy at all photo of my wife, uh, <laughs> um, you'll see that the, the candle is an orange glow to it and that orange glow is then projected onto her face and hands. And then the next is light dispersion. And uh, I don't know if we have any gamers or 3D artists in the room, but it's what's called ray tracing. And it's essentially just how the, an understanding of how light interacts with uh, objects in your composition. And uh, here you can see like the floor is shiny, the area is well lit, which makes her dress illuminate the floor with her, the colors of her dress. And the farther away you get from the the source of what's bouncing off of her, the more kind of ambiguous blur it becomes. And so just little details like that really help you uh, sell that it's a real piece. And then finally, we have depth of field, uh, which is a property of all cameras, or rather lenses, um, that you can uh, fluctuate from either having the entire image be in focus or just a sliver of focus. Um, okay, and so with this in mind, let's move on to color matching. And so you see that the, the, the light source is the sun and it's warm. And so I adjust, uh, the projector is very yellow tuned, <laughs> but I essentially take the light source and adjust the colors of the objects in my composition to that light source. And I went ahead and did that to all of the objects. And then I like to add little camera effects. Uh, so if you have like a really bright object in the background, a lot of times you'll get kind of light bloom around it. And when you have a an object in front of a really bright light source, it kind of adds color fringing around uh, the subject that is being illuminated from behind. And so I added some little overexposure color fringing around the wing tips. And then also because the light source, there's a light source coming from the top, it's gonna cast shadow uh, underneath her on the wings. And so I, I added a couple uh, artistic style choices, more lighting, more shading, and this is what we've got. And then from there, I kind of all compile it together and do some traditional uh, color grading, and this is the outcome. And so now that you know my process, uh, I'm gonna really quickly just go through um, a couple uh, collages of pieces and then the outcome of all those pieces together. And so I got really excited and I went out and I got a green screen. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone knows how, uh, how to work with green screens, but it's not like that. This was very difficult to pull her the, from the background. But uh, I took all these elements and I made my wife kind of floating on a, a piece of earth, astral projecting through the cosmos and just surfing the waves. And then uh, this was a learning process where I discovered when you have a subject that you want to put AI elements on, it is incredibly difficult to get the AI to output something in his proportions and body size and position, so it requires a lot of Photoshop to just manipulate it how you want. And then this was the outcome of that one. And then on the creepier side of things, uh, I wanted to kind of make a mirror world, uh, so I didn't do too much uh, AI generation on this and more so just photo manipulation. And then, I have kind of the evil world on the bottom where like, she might be a little possessed with the normal world up top, which is kind of an inverse of what you might expect. And then the final one is we've got uh, one of my friends and I kind of wanted to have her sitting on a cliff face looking into like a, a mystical sky. And this one was a little difficult because there was a person and I couldn't not get a person. Uh, and so there was a lot of manipulation put into this one as well. And this was the outcome of that one. And so with that, I just thank you. I really, I really appreciate you. Oh yeah, questions.
kind of rapid fire, sorry. <laughs> So do you tend to now work on individual images, or do you tend to have like uh, ideas that you want to create multiple images for? Um, it kind of depends. Uh, there, there's definitely. Uh, I'll talk into here. Um, it, it depends. There's uh, certain. I get certain inspirations that I can envision like a, a theme for, um, but a lot of the times it's just. I get an idea, or like I take a photo of something, and it sparks an idea, and I just take that idea and run with it. And whether it's a traditional composite or an AI composite depends on the photos that I have on hand and the time I have, uh, because photography is not my my full time job, so I have limited time. And uh, if I have, I, I have years of backlogs of photos that I go through, um, but if nothing is really lining up quite right, then I'll I'll turn to the AI board. How long do you spend on any particular image from beginning to finish, finished image? Um, I, s I would say it would range from between 12 hours and maybe like a day or two. Like it, it really depends on either the amount of photos, uh, how much I, I care how real, it, like so certain, <laughs> certain projects I really, I get really passionate about and I'll, take the time and do the really fine details. But other ones where uh, I feel bad to admit it, but like halfway through the process, if, if it's really not turning out how I want, it becomes very disheartening. And so I don't really put in that extra effort to really push it past like to, to what I can actually achieve. And uh, those projects don't always get shown. I have a lot of composite works that are 75% of the way finished and I just can't <laughs> get to the end. So if it, if it was your full-time job, who, who would be paying you for your images? Well, I mean, I'm just interested. I, I don't need to ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, who would be your ideal client, I guess is the question. Who can you choose? That's a, it's a good question. And... I, I can't give you any first-hand uh, first knowledge on that, but I have heard that a lot of, uh, well, for instance, there has been publications, like major media publications that, um, with the whole new like, outbreak of image generative AI, that uh, they wanted to feature an entirely AI image on like the cover of their magazine. Um, I can't think of what it is at the top of my head but I, I remember it being like a, a unicorn uh, space person on the moon. Like it was just, or it was like a, the, a female uh, astronaut unicorn something on the moon. And it, it was a big deal that they did. Uh, and I could see if the trend continues of, of that, of having just the, the, the collaboration of art and, and tech become a thing. Uh, but I haven't done a lot of searching. Um, I would love to do it, but I'd <laughs> I, I'm not a, a marketing person, and I'm not a, uh, I'm not a very good business person yet, so. In regards to AI, uh, in the time you've been doing it, uh, I'm curious as to what improvements you've seen, if it's in how you ask the questions and the prompts, or if it's on the other side, uh, what's the results? Yeah, so uh, that's a really good question, and uh, it makes me really excited because when I started, uh, it wasn't at a point like I, I was more of a like a, a hobbyist, I would say, in the aspect of this. I just like making AI images and seeing what I can get it to produce, um, and this was like right after it released, and while it made really good images. Uh, they weren't necessarily photorealistic in a sense. They, they still had that kind of like computer-generated look to them, or they were way too abstract to where it, it just was incoherent. And it wasn't until uh, the next iteration that, that came out of the software that I use where it really exploded. And you can put in prompts, and you can tailor the prompts to make some really convincing uh, 
like even if it's something that doesn't exist, like you would believe it existed because it generated an incredible image. And it was at that point where I was, I realized that, like, oh, I can mix this with my photography. Um, and I'll, like I know having someone flying through multiple weird rings and stuff, like that's not real, but it has a level of clarity that, that uh, could fool you, I guess, uh, allow you to suspend your disbelief. Yeah, it's come a long way. So maybe along the same uh, question of, of how much time you put into the, the development, if you were just to look at the amount of time to cut the edges around a person's shape, yeah, what, what kind of time is involved in that? <laughs> and how close do you have to get in order to make it really crisp without cutting off their toes or their hair <laughs> or something? It's funny you bring that up because that's part of the thing that I that I omitted was the process of of uh, masking objects. Uh, so it, it it honestly depends on the creator. Uh, if you want the kind of uh, collage art style of just having things like um, pasted on one another and not to like put that art style down, it's its own thing. Uh, but Photoshop has an auto-select tool now because they're implementing a lot of AI in, in Photoshop as well. Uh, and so you have the ability to, you can literally just scribble over an image or a part of the image and it'll, be, it'll recognize like, oh, you want this. And so it'll select that. Mm -hmm. um, that selection is great for really quick work, um, but it's not 100% accurate. And I am kind of a perfectionist and I don't like having those little imperfections, and so I'll spend the time, zoom in until the image is just like giant square pixels and take out all of the things so that all that's left is what I want and not extra little artifacts. And so it, it's fairly time consuming. <laughs> Pretty cool. Hmm. Thank you. Hmm. Anybody else, questions? Cool. Thank Very you. Good. Oh. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Don't forget the cakes by the door. <laughs>